Good morning, Harbor Lake. It's good to be in God's house on this gorgeous day. It's always good to be together with God's people, but when we can enjoy the nice weather, enjoy all of God's blessings, it's a, it's a wonderful day and a wonderful opportunity. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I think I know most folks here this morning, but if I haven't had a chance to say hello, my name's Bradley Thomas. I serve you as senior pastor here at Harbor Lake Baptist Church, and uh, we're glad that you're here. Uh, this morning, it's, um, like I said, just a beautiful day to be here, and I'm excited to uh, worship with us today, and we're going to have a great day. Just a couple of quick things for you to know. Um, we have a new Sunday school curriculum. Uh, we have started that this week, and um, Ken Wilkes is our um, new Sunday school director, and he's making his way up at this time, and he's just going to give you a quick word real quick about our new Sunday school literature, and then he's going to lead us in prayer, and then we're going to have a time of worship this morning. So y'all welcome Ken Wilkes up this morning. Good morning, folks. So you should have gotten a new Sunday school book this morning. If you were in Sunday school, if you weren't in Sunday school, you need to get it. You need to go to Sunday school so you can get your Sunday school book. Uh, we're going back to the uh, Answers in Genesis study that we did a number of years ago. I would tell you how long ago, but I can't remember. But um, a lot of you, if you're like me and a few other people that have talked to me, our uh, Sunday school material that we've been using just leaves a little bit to be desired. And uh, we need something with a little bit more, a uh, little bit more meat and less milk. So we'll uh, we'll start this, and uh, my thanks go to Tina for for uh, getting this, getting the material, and getting it printed out a lot at a lot less cost than uh, than what we had before. And if you got any questions about it, feel free feel free to ask me. And uh, without any further ado. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can be in your house to hear the word, to worship you, and to hear the, the, the word spoken. Lord, I ask that you give Pastor Bradley the, the uh, boldness and courage he needs to give us that word. Lord, um, we thank you for your presence in here because we know your word says that we're two or more gathered that you're here. Lord, if there be any hindering spirits in this place, we ask that you would cast them away right now. Lord, uh, let your spirit fill this place, fill the grounds such that anybody who passes by will fall under conviction and uh, realize that their, their need to have their sins forgiven. Now, Lord, bless our worship. Let it be a pleasing scent in your nostrils. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and the only name by which we can be saved. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church family. Let's stand and... Um, rise up and praise him because every praise and all glory and honor belongs to him. your glory. All those on the mountain top be glad, shout for joy. Rise up and praise Him. He deserves our love. Rise up and praise Him. Worship the whole Let the earth be glad. Let the people of God seek His praise all over the land. Everyone in the valley, come and let your voice. All those on the mountain top be glad. Shout for joy. Rise up and praise. Worship 
talking about love for the day is near. And to this, understanding the present time, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is near now than when we first believed. 
The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds and of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that your word encourages us to live daily without awareness of your presence and to be ready for your return. As kingdom servants, we want to be found faithful. We recognize that everything, everything that we have belongs to you. Please accept the tithes and offerings we present to you today as part of our worship. A thanks offering for all the blessings you have given to us. Bless and multiply them to accomplish your will through the ministries of Harbor Lake. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the best of years, barely breathing, when I'm not been good just to worship this morning all of our praise goes to Jesus this morning every word of worship is to our God so this morning um, it's, it's just been great to be in his house great Sunday school great worship great everything so far and so thank y'all for being here this morning and we're looking forward to continuing our series we've been talking about here lately it's triggered by truth and we're going to continue doing that this morning. If you have your Bible, Genesis 1 is where we're going to be tonight, or this morning. See, I'm already ready for bed tonight. This morning we're in Genesis 1. And um, before we get started, I, 
I have to tell you about my friend Joe. He has started a new type of diet, and it's called the Dolly Parton diet. And you see he has, well, this, this, you'll like this one, uh, Kaya. The Dolly Parton diet, you see my friend Joe has been on it, and he's been watching what he eats and exercises, and they call it the Dolly Parton diet because, you see, it's going to make Joe lean, Joe lean, <laughs> Joe lean, Joe lean. Okay. You know that one? All right. So, it, when in doubt, you can go on the same diet as Joe. It's the Dolly Parton diet. Now, this morning, as we continue, and we're thinking about being triggered by truth and how the world, when we take a stance, a bold biblical stance, the world doesn't like it. And part of the reason the world doesn't like when we take a bold biblical stance is because if they were having to face the fact that they are a sinner, they're going to have to deal with it. And so if they can just not think about it, if they can just reject the Bible, reject truth, they don't have to face the reality that they are a sinner and that God is a just God and he cannot look on sin with the least of allowance. And so the problem comes in when we think that we know better than God. And so as we continue our series, keep all this in mind. And keep in mind that the things that we're talking about today, it's backed by Scripture. And so if, if it's today or if it's next Sunday, if I say something and you start to think, well, that's offensive. Well, it's because the gospel is offensive. Because when we have to look inward and we realize that we are sinners and that we have to deal with it, then that does create a, a problem. And so if we step on your toes, if I step on your toes in any part of this series, don't throw rocks at me. I'm just the messenger. Take it up with the author. And what you'll find is that's an argument you're not going to win. And so today we're going to be discussing a very sensitive topic in the world we live in. And what we're going to be talking about is transgenderism. Right now we're seeing transgenderism infiltrate all the different areas of the world we live in today. And so the term transgender, this is a definition for someone who is uh, denoting or relating to a person whose gender identity does not correspond with the sex registered to them at birth. And so the world, here's where we're going to look at what the world says, and then we're going to look at what Scripture says. So let's look first at what the world says. The world says that gender is a spectrum and that there is no finite number of gender identities. You see that in the world. That is what is believed in the world. But when, if you've got your Bible, Genesis 1, 27, let's look at what God says. And so the word of the Lord says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. May we hide it in our heart that we may not sin against you. And as our culture leads, leans further away from you, God, may we always hold truth up, hold the standard up high. Not that we are judging or, or casting that we are better than anybody because we are sinners, but we are saved and we are saved by a merciful God. And we are saved to walk in a newness of life that we would not be sinners, but rather we would live transformed lives so that the world around us could see. And so, God, as we tackle this difficult subject matter today, I pray that we would have an open heart to what you would teach us. I pray that you would challenge us. And if there be any where where we disagree with you, that you would allow us to see Scripture, to see truth, and to realize that you are the authority in our lives. So thank you, God, for giving us the Bible. Thank you for the brave men who, who got this in our hands by translating it into English that all common people could have it. There was a time where not everybody had a copy of your word. But 
because of your bold servants, it was translated into English. So thank you for that, how we take it so for granted. Father, we love you and we praise you. And we lift high the name of Jesus today. Amen. Amen. So let's take a look at this next slide. Here we have a couple pictures that kind of relate to what is going on in our culture today. Now you see, the Word of God is truth, and it's truth today, yesterday, and forevermore. The culture changes all around us. What was once unacceptable years ago is now not only practiced, but celebrated. And so there is within our culture this kind of identity and this kind of craving for transgenderism. And so UCLA, the School of Law at Williams Institute, reports that there is a percentage of adults who identify as transgender and it had remained steady up until 2017 at 0.6%. But we have seen a sharp rise in the number of transgender people between the ages of 13 and 24. And the study found that between 13 and 17, that number is 1.4%. And then when you look at 18 through 24, that number jumps, or it goes down actually to 1.3 of people who identify themselves as transgender. Five years ago, those same numbers were at 0.7%. As you can see, what is the, it's starting to tick up, isn't it? We're starting to see. And so together, these two groups estimate and account for 700,000 people in our country. Now you might think, why is that important today? Why does that matter? Those numbers seem low. Who are we to tell people how they should feel? What gives us the right? And the reason that it's important is because that small minority, okay, they're pushing to indoctrine a generation of children and teach them something that is morally and ethically wrong. The truth behind this push, it's very easily seen that it's a target on children. Forgive me for a minute. (laughs) Um, What we see is children at a young age being conditioned by the world around them to follow things that are contrary to scripture. And it's, it's all over. When I was in Boston recently, there was some discussion about curriculum and, and one of the church planners had a friend who said, I'd like to enroll my kindergartner into school here in the public school system, but I understand that y'all teach transgenderism. What day are y'all teaching that so I can pull him and keep him home that day? And they said, you don't understand, we lead with that in all areas, in all disciplines, you know. And he said, that's enough, that's all I need to know. I'm going to pull my child out of school. Did you know that there are a number of children's hospitals that are performing gender-affirming care to children? And an example of this is the Seattle Children's Hospital in Seattle, Washington. And they are accepting new patients between the ages of 9 and 16. A 9-year-old can't decide what color bike to ride down the street, let alone a major decision that's going to affect them for their entire life. This comes back to we have to... Invest in a generation of children and teach them truth. It won't be popular. It'll be against what is going against what is acceptable nowadays. But it's the truth. These services that are being given to these children are puberty blockers, gender-affirming hormones, and gender-affirming surgeries. That's what they're calling it to make it sound a little better. Because genital mutilation sounds scary, but calling it gender-affirming On the other hand, that is different. Along with parental consent, they'll start working with these children as young as nine. That's nine. That's that's not even double digits yet. And they want to work with them. And the lie that's being pushed and the lie that we can know that we're, we're truly not meant to feel this way. That's what they're pushing. You know, you're feeling this way. You need to go with it. 
what it all points back to is that it's a concept that we are our own God and that we know better than God. To say that God made a mistake. God didn't know what he was talking about. This happens in other countries too. Sweden, let's talk about Sweden for a moment. They are a very pro-gender surgery nation. And over the past 30 years, they've really been pushing this, even, even now that it's reaching here. And Dr. Ryan Anderson is a doctor who strongly stands in opposition to transgender reassignment. And he gave us these numbers in Sweden. Listen to this. So extending over 30 years and conducted in Sweden, Sweden where the culture is strongly supporting transgenderism, he documents... There is a lifelong mental unrest amongst these people. That 10 to 15 years after surgical reassignment, that the suicide rate of those who have undergone these assignments rose 20 times in comparison to their peers that did not have the surgery. Let me introduce you to somebody. Uh, Travis, show this picture right here. This is Scott Nougat. And this is somebody who transitioned from female to male. And if you look up the story of, of Scott Nugent, you're going to see really a heartbreaking story. And, and Scott says, I found it, the magical cure to who I never, the, that I never fit in anywhere. At 42, I was unable to resist the allure. But soon after I began the process, I learned the truth in battle to save my life. That battle included a pulmonary embolism, a stress-induced heart attack, sepsis surgery, failed arm reconstruction surgery, 17 months of recurring bacteria infections, over 30 rounds of antibiotics, one month of IV antibiotics, seven surgeries, dozens of ER visits and hospitalization, failed bottom surgery and recurring infections to this day that will someday, if not clear, with antibiotics due to overuse, it could lead to an early death and over a million dollars in medical complications. What is this truth that I spoke of, Scott said? That medical transition is experimental, dangerous, and doesn't cure anything. And it makes for a mental health issue. These are the facts regardless of feelings. Medical transition is cosmic surgery. For some, it does help them walk a little bit higher in life, but not many. But conceiving society, it's life-saving equals $1.3 million dollars and synthetic hormones for every child they convinced was born in the wrong body. The issue is that they struggle with gender dysphoria. And the realization that we have as we think about this, when it comes to gender dysphoria, it's not found in surgery, it's not found in a bottle of pills. The issue is that our children and our people that are lost need a relationship with Jesus Christ. God created us in His image. Distinctly male and female. The LGBT foundation, this is a foundation that, that states a woman is someone who identifies as a woman. Well, isn't that special? They can just, you can just say you're a woman and that makes you a woman. To make something true, all we have to do is identify as it. And it makes it true. That's what they teach. And so with that being said, I want to identify as a neurosurgeon. And I'm going to start performing brain operations in the parking lot after the service. Who will be my first client? It's like, no... John Ira does not need a brain transplant. Anyone who wants a brain transplant needs to go see a real surgeon. 
Declaring myself a brain surgeon doesn't make me a brain surgeon. Are you following me? Amen. All right. Maybe I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express one time. But that doesn't qualify me either like those commercials used to say. The Cambridge Dictionary, if you look up words, you know, there's a definition and then there's supplemental definitions. And recently they added to the definition of a woman. It's an adult who lives and identifies as a female, though they may have been said to have had a different sex at birth. And so during COVID, something I heard a lot of was trust the science. So look at this picture, and let's talk about this picture of what makes a woman a woman and what makes a male a male. Chromosomes, right? So a male has what is known as the XY chromosome. You'll see it up here in the blue. The female chromosome, it looks like an X, and they call it the XX chromosome, okay? Where is trust the science when it comes to this? Because this has been around, this is not a new concept. Do you know when we figured out about these chromosomes? A guy, a scientist by the name of Herman Henking figured it out in 1890. Nobody was around in 1890 that I know of. Anybody in here, 1890? I know, I know you're thinking Jim Brooks, but no, he was not. No, David, David was thinking it. I saw it in his eye. We have to laugh. This is such a serious topic. We have to have some humor. But no, we don't trust the science now because feeling trumps the science. Feelings is what gets us into a lot of trouble as humans. We follow our heart instead of following the path that God had designed for us. And so the reality we have with this topic today is that it's catching us off guard. We're hearing these stories and we're seeing these things that catch us by surprise. And I hear people say, what's, what's next? What can, what can possibly happen worse? And then something else, you hear something else. But I want to reassure you that none of this caught God by surprise. He knew that there would come a day when the issue of, of gender would come up. He knew that we needed something to help sort out the chaos. And so in the Bible, we saw earlier that we were created in his own image. And years ago, somebody is reading this scripture, and they're going through that, and he made the man and woman. Duh, that makes sense, that checks out. Fast forward to today, when right is wrong and wrong is right, and up is down and down is up, and... and we need direction, and we need to have something we can stand on. Because somebody say, well, I just don't believe your cisgendered point of view. It's not about being cisgendered, which means, you know, you're what you say you were at birth. It's about saying what God says. I don't have the authority to make the claim that man is man and female is female, but God does. Because God is the creator of all things. Had God wanted a spectrum of gender, it would have been his, his wish and his pleasure and his desire, and he would have done that. But that wasn't in his plan. He created Adam and Eve. And so we are created in that image. We need the truth more than we need the feelings of the world today. Think about feelings. The Bible talks about our feelings. Jeremiah talks about it in Jeremiah 17, 9. Jeremiah says that the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? That's making a lot more sense nowadays too. Amen. Who can understand it? The feelings that people have and the thoughts and the desires. So the question then creeps in, why did God create gender? And why did he create females? Turn with me to Genesis 2. We're going to spend a few minutes in Genesis 2 and look at Look at this. I'll go ahead and tell you right now, I am pro-female. My wife is a female. Amen. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. People say that Christianity has, over time, taken a negative view of women. And I say that is false. The Bible has actually done more for females than any other religion on the planet. 
you want to talk about liberating, ask a Muslim person about their view on women. It doesn't hold to a biblical standard. You ask other religions and, and they, they don't have a high view of women. We as Christians have a high view of women. We love women and we lift up and we thank God for women. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this and think about females. So look with me, we're Genesis 2, we're going to start with verse 8. And I just want to read and we're going to skip a little bit, so just I'll try to direct you here. Verse 8 says, The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now we know that those were what? Off limits. Skip down to verse 15 with me. Let's look at this. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. So Adam gave the names to all cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, verse 21 says, and he slept and took one of his ribs... And closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and brought her to, to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They were both naked, the man and his wife, and then were not ashamed. God created two genders, male and female. This right here is the truth. Male and females, and this is created within all, all different spectrums. Thank you. All different, all, I said spectrum, all of animal kingdom, okay? We have males and females. And we see the reason for this being that males and females produce offsprings. We see it in the animal kingdom, we see it with mankind. And so the woman was created to be a helper to Adam. And I want to quote um, David Guzik this morning because he, he puts it so eloquently. God gives to man the responsibility and the accountability to be the leader of the home and gives the woman the responsibility and the accountability to help him. Some translations call it a helpmeet. Some call it a helper. It just depends on what your Bible says. Different translations put it differently. But a woman is to help the husband. The, the wife helps the husband. Not only was the woman put there to be a helper... But she was made comparable to the man. Male and female, they're comparable, right? They're, they're different, but they're also a lot the same. She should be considered and honored as such. A woman or a wife cannot be regarded as merely a tool or worker, but as a partner in God's grace and equal in human standing. Amen. We hold high our... Men, we hold high our wives. A woman is not given to us to be a slave and a servant, but a helper. Amen. 
and when we have a view that a woman is in there to serve us and do everything for us, we've missed the boat on that. We work together, and we run a household. And so you look at my household, and you've got me, and you've got my wife, and you've got three kids. And it's this umbrella that you have God as the head of the household, the head of the church, the head of our life is God. And then God gives direction to that husband and, and helps him to know how to lead his family. And then, and then the umbrella, that, it's an umbrella that covers the wife and the kids. And then with the, the wife, she is the umbrella that, that covers the children. And, and it's not about pecking order and about who's this and who's that. It's about a family unit that together grows in the faith and admonition of the Lord to lift high the name of the Lord as the family unit. This is what is being fought against. In the world we live in, they don't want to see a successful family. They don't want to see a mommy and a daddy together raising a family. They want to see dysfunction. They want to see something other than what God ordained here in Scripture. God is the one that set the standard. And we as humans think, well, we can change it around. And that's just not so. So the question that becomes... What do we do with something like this? It's a lot to look at. It's a lot to think about. But if you start to kind of pray and seek God's face through a topic like this, God just reveals things to you. And I got to thinking about this, and it's kind of like, what is driving this? Other than just moral decay, what is driving this? And I start to see this picture of a will, a money will. All right, think about this. Those medicines cost money. The wheel keeps turning. The doctors are performing these surgeries, and they're not cheap. Anybody got a guess of the price range for one of these surgeries? It's seventy to $100,000. That's a lot of money. And then on top of that, then you have the hormones, and, and a lot will have some more surgeries. And you see it just becomes... A money will. And my fear is that out of the greed of money, doctors are going against their Hippocratic oath that they said that they would do no harm in the name of the almighty dollar. Amen. And that bothers me. Amen. And that bothers me that, that our doctors are being swayed not only by culture but by money. And so when it comes to a message like this, we have to ask ourselves, where do we go from here? Maybe I've said something that stepped on a toe. Maybe I didn't. I'm not trying to step on a toe. I'm trying to show you truth this morning. And so how do we fill the hole in our heart with anything other than Jesus? We can't. Drugs and alcohol won't fill that hole. A transgender reassignment surgery won't fill that hole. Nothing that we can do fills that hole except for Jesus Christ. And so the church needs to respond and meet the needs of those that suffer from gender dysphoria by counseling them and showing them the love of Jesus Christ. We have a tendency as Christians, and this is for, for all of us, myself included, when it comes to sin, we look on sin and we, you know, well, I can deal with a, a drunk much better than I can deal with somebody who has transgender issues. They both have issues. Amen. Don't look down on somebody because they sin differently than you do. Don't do it. It becomes a dangerous precedence because then we've placed ourselves above somebody else. Instead, we need to love and help people through this. Now, the world's not going to like it. The world's not going to like us taking these bold stances by saying, get this filth out of the libraries. Get this filth out of the classroom. Don't promote these evil ideas. But we are going to stand firm on the truth of God. We're not going to kneel to the popular opinion, but rather stand for biblical truth. And so that's how the church responds. By standing up for our young people 
by teaching them to hold high the value and the view of Scripture. You know, they're, they're coming for everything. And they want everything. And so it, it won't be long before the pressure starts against the church. You know that. You know that's what's coming next. And, and all it takes is one kid coming to the Awana Club and going home and saying, we, we did these pledges. And, and I said a pledge, and, and uh, the Awana Pledge says that uh, our goal is to reach boys and girls with the gospel of Christ. And all of a sudden, the culture says, y'all need to change that pledge. You can't say boys and girls anymore. You have to say they, thems, and zers, and all this craziness. If we let the culture dictate morality, then we have lost any moral ground that we can stand on. Culture will push against us on every form and every way. And here's the reality. We don't change to fit the culture. We allow God to change from within. God's the one that does the changes. He is the one that convicts of sins. And what we need to do is we need to see Jesus move in a mighty way. And so here is how we close a time like this. It's like I kept thinking, how do, we, how do you close something as heavy as this message has been? And it really has been a struggle for me this week as I've thought about this and prayed on this. But the closing of this is simple. If you're struggling with your identity, whether it be as, as extreme as wanting a, a change of gender, or maybe it's just your identity and knowing who you belong to. Let me tell you who you belong to. We sung about him this morning. Every praise to our God. Glory, hallelujah. He is our Savior. He is our Redeemer. And we hold to Him. And my fear is that we let the world dictate our relationship with Jesus. And we start to question, well, am I believing the right things? Hold firm in your conviction. If it doesn't match the culture, then, uh, spoiler alert, you're probably thinking and feeling the right thing toward the Lord. So as we have a time, maybe you know somebody that's suffering through this. Maybe you know somebody that has struggled with this. And your heart is for them. Maybe you come pray for them at a time like this. Whatever your need is, today is the day of salvation. Let God do the work within you. Thank you all so much. Let's pray. Father, what a time we've had this morning thinking about all that you are. I am deeply moved on this topic. Father, because I have children. And the reality is these children are going to grow up in a world that hates them and hates you. Father, give the next generation the courage to stand in the face of oppression and persecution. Don't let them believe the lies of the enemy. Let them stand upon the word of the Lord. Even better than we in this generation have done. I pray that the church will continue to grow and expand and reach those that have a message that's against it. God, a message that's the world has... It's, it's against everything that we believe in. It's a message. It's, it's an anti-family message. It's an anti-male, anti-female. Just help us, Lord. Help us, God. As we face what is to come, Give us boldness. Give us the strength that you've given those that came before us. Oh, to have the strength of, of a Joshua or a prophet like Jeremiah or Daniel, whoever it might be, God, that you have empowered. That same power that you gave them, you've given to us. And yet we sit and do nothing with it. God, stir our hearts. 
that we would be your people. Thank you, God. We love you and we praise you. Help us to do business with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, stand and let's sing together. so much.